a mysterious traveler, a blue box, and two words that echo across time and space forevermore. In 1963, Doctor Who first premiered on television and left an indelible mark on pop culture and science fiction. Thrown together by a scrappy but ambitious production team, the series was envisioned as a love letter to all the wonder and terror of the Atomic Age, taking viewers to alien planets and lost civilizations alongside the Doctor and his companions. Originally developed as an educational program for family audiences, Doctor Who would grow into a cultural phenomenon over its original run, producing an incredible 26 seasons before its cancellation in 1989. But even that wouldn't be the end. Rub. Through an impeccable mix of endearing characters, captivating stories, and a willingness to adapt behind the scenes, the series built an intensely dedicated following that would continue its legacy long after it left the air. Even after countless properties have built and iterated on its success, Doctor Who remains as timeless and iconic as ever, giving viewers, young and old, a window into a universe where anything is possible. Ever since we could dream about the future, science fiction has held a massive place in popular culture, letting us channel our hopes and our fears of the future into stories. While the genre has roots dating all the way back to the dawn of literature, it would peak over the 20th century through the rise of industrialization and the post-war boom of the atomic age, with the awesome power of nuclear energy giving rise to creature features like Godzilla, alien invasions like The Day the Earth Stood Still, and high-concept adventures like Fantastic Voyage. It would be this sense of wonder and adventure that Sidney Newman, C.E. Weber, and Donald Wilson would channel into a new show for the British Broadcasting Corporation, replacing the old Saturday series Materials with something more modern and all-ages friendly. Drawing heavily from his love of science fiction, Newman would eventually come up with the original idea for Doctor Who, an old man and his young friends traveling through time in a police box. Up to the age of 40, I don't think there was a science fiction book I hadn't read. I love them because they're a marvelous way, a safe way, of saying nasty things about our own society, Newman would reflect. I'd read H.G. Wells, of course, and I recalled his book The Time Machine. That inspired me to dream up the time-space machine for Doctor Who. I then dreamed up this senile old man to be the running character. He's fled in terror from another planet in the spaceship which lands on Earth in the form of a police box. However, this dim old guy doesn't know how to operate the machine, presses the wrong button, and they take off. And that was the idea. Unfortunately, the idea wasn't well received by BBC leadership, who saw science fiction as little more than cheap, kids-only entertainment. While the series was given the go-ahead for development, it was clear that the network's higher-ups were skeptical from the beginning. As such, Newman began putting together a team of outsiders for the show, including Verity Lambert, who became the BBC's first female producer, Waris Hussein, their first Indian director, David Whitaker, who served as story editor, and Anthony Coburn as scriptwriter. Working off of Newman's original pitch, the team rocketed ahead with development, starting with the heart of the program, its core cast. First appearing in the pilot An Unearthly Child, Doctor Who's main characters are heavily modeled on the archetypes of classic sci-fi serials. William Russell's Ian Chesterton and Jacqueline Hill's Barbara Wright play the parts of traditional heroic leads, brought by Carol Ann Ford's Susan Foreman into the mysterious world of the Doctor. Brought to life through veteran actor William Hartnell, the Doctor fills the archetypes of both creature and scientist, launching the group's many adventures and butting heads with Ian and Barbara, who he kidnaps in the pilot. Grandfather, let them go now, please. Look, if they don't understand, they can't hurt us at all. It's out of the question. Lovely guy. But while Doctor Who begins with the well-worn formula of scared humans meeting unknowable aliens, these characters evolve over the first four seasons. Early episodes like the Aztecs would hint at a lengthy backstory fraught with mistakes, while later episodes saw the Doctor's selfish, prickly exterior give way to a newfound compassion and a strong sense of justice. We cannot live with you. You're, you're different. You've got no feelings. Feelings? I do not understand that word. Emotions, love, pride, hate, fear. Have you no emotions, sir? This evolution would only build over Hartnell's tenure, with the Doctor growing into more of a lead role as his companions became part of a growing supporting cast. 
Susan, Ian, and Barbara would eventually leave, replaced by more diverse sidekicks including a pilot from the future, a handmaiden from ancient Troy, and even a space special security agent, whatever that is. Every companion brings their own flair to the series, but they're all united by the common thread of the Doctor's evolution as he grows from the mysterious outsider into his own twist on the heroic leading man. Despite a rocky start, the diverse group of minds behind Doctor Who had laid the foundations for a definitive sci-fi series. A generation of viewers were standing on the threshold of an all-new universe of imagination. All they had to do was open the door and step in. Just like its characters, Doctor Who's plots began firmly steeped in the tropes of classic Atomic Age sci-fi. Its pilot, An Unearthly Child, is even a twist on the classic alien abduction tale, with Ian and Barbara imprisoned by the Doctor in an effort to keep himself and his granddaughter hidden. While the BBC's stance on sci-fi left the program on shaky ground as is, the pilot itself was plagued with issues through its production. Countless rewrites and disagreements on the story led to writer Anthony Coburn's exit, and problems with sets caused extensive reshoots that continued up until the month before the pilot's airing. Even the episode's November 23rd premiere was hindered by widespread blackouts and, no joke, the assassination of President Kennedy, which prompted the BBC to re-air it back-to-back -back with its sequel, Cave of Skulls. It was a total disaster, but the follow-up serial would end up launching a meteoric rise to popularity, bringing a deeper focus on social commentary and the debut of the series' most quintessential villains, the Daleks. Created by Terry Nation as a reaction to the threat of nuclear war, as well as Nation's memories of growing up during World War II, the Daleks were the Doctor's first real nemesis, pushing him from a passive observer into a protector of time and space. They were also a massive gamble for the program. By the time the serial began production, support for Doctor Who had diminished, with the show teetering on cancellation after its first four episodes. The crisis came when Donald Wilson saw the scripts for the first Dalek serial, Lambert would reflect. There was a strong disagreement between us, in fact it went as far as him telling us not to do the show. What saved it in the end was purely the fact that we had nothing to replace it in the time allotted. It was the Daleks, or nothing. Luckily, these doubts quickly died as the serial exploded in popularity, growing the show's audience exponentially and launching the BBC's first merchandising boom. The widespread success of Dalek Mania served as the template for many of Doctor Who's foundational stories, with the increasingly heroic Doctor facing off against Atomic Age invaders like the Vord, the Coquillion, Cybermen, and many, many new factions of the returning Daleks. All of these stories lean more into fantasy than fact, but Newman's adherence to the program's educational roots adds just enough real-world reasoning to make each location and its inhabitants feel believable and weighty. This is helped along through brilliant production design, ironically brought about through a complete lack of funding, with an average budget of £2,000 per episode, roughly $42,000 today. While Doctor Who had very little funding of its own, the crew did have access to the BBC's resources, including the organization's radiophonics lab. Composers Ron Grainer and Delia Derbyshire used a variety of radio broadcasting equipment to engineer the show's ethereal theme song, pioneering the technique of musical sampling by cutting, modifying, and mixing the piece across several tracks of analog tape. Sets and costumes like the Daleks' armor and the TARDIS's interior were cobbled together from household materials and coupled with basic editing tricks to mimic the wonder and scale of bigger-budget sci-fi films. This inventiveness would give rise to some of the show's most iconic elements, including the many details that bring the Doctor's time machine to life, but it would also give Doctor Who the means to live far beyond what its creators imagined. By season four, William Hartnell's health had begun to decline, leading to his eventual exit. But rather than bringing in a new lead character, the production team came up with the idea to transform the Doctor through a concept that would later be named Regeneration. In a flash of light, Hartnell was gone, and Patrick Troughton emerged as the second Doctor. With this new lead came a new direction for the series, and the horror-tinged parables of nuclear war gave way to a broader focus on comedy, fun, and the adventure of the space age. In fact, these reinventions would continue with each new Doctor, letting the program evolve alongside popular culture. John Pertwee would bring an action-heavy spy angle, rounding the Doctor on Earth to battle the renegade Time Lord, the Master, who was dreamed up as the Blofeld to the newly James Bondified lead. 
This in turn would give way to Tom Baker's psychedelic spectacle and youthful defiance, launching the Doctor back into space and pitting him against fascistic post-humans like the mad Dr. Solon and Davros, the genocidal creator of the Dalek race. Peter Davison's tenure was equal parts back to basics and an attempt at operatic scale, maybe to capitalize on the success of bigger budget space epics. Colin Baker's sixth Doctor used high-concept adventures to explore the abstracts of good and evil, swinging between the two to critique on the moral decay of the 80s. He was mostly just a massive dick, though. And finally, Sylvester McCoy's seventh Doctor was a synthesis of everything that came before, tackling operatic plots and dystopian themes with a generally lighter tone. But even as Doctor Who's plots changed through the decades, relying more on action and increasingly janky special effects, one element continued to hold the show together. A sense of hope for the future and humankind's limitless potential. Our lives are different to anybody else's. That's the exciting thing. Nobody in the universe can do what we're doing. Unlike the nightmarish invaders he kept colliding with, the Doctor was a character that only grew more human as the series went on, speaking out against cruelty and using his power to defend the helpless of the universe, all while enriching the lives of his many companions. While its early years embodied the public's fear of an uncertain future, Doctor Who would become a celebration of the wonders of the unknown, a spirit that would keep it alive decade after decade and build a legacy that would continue long after the series' final days. Arriving at a major flashpoint in television history, Doctor Who's overnight popularity made it an institution in British pop culture. But even something that massively successful must come to an end. In truth, the show's cancellation wasn't the result of an abrupt decision, but a series of issues that had plagued it since its debut. Doctor Who's newfound success also brought criticism from morality campaigners like Mary Whitehouse, who became an outspoken critic of what she decried as violent, gory content. <laughs> Truly, the stuff of nightmares. These criticisms would also center around the series' political leanings, which often came off as vocally anti-war and anti-military, with the last few seasons delivering a scathing commentary on Margaret Thatcher's conservative administration. Mounting critiques and a general aimlessness in direction quickly eroded the BBC's faith in Doctor Who, compounded by a revolution in practical and computer effects through big-budget blockbusters that made the show look flimsy by comparison. We had to rely on the story because there was little we could do with the effects, reflected producer Philip Hinchcliffe. Star Wars in a way was the turning point. Once Star Wars had happened, Doctor Who effectively was out of date from that moment on, judged by that level of technological expertise. The first shot was of the starship going over, and I said, the game's up, we're dead. The effects weren't the only part of the series' production that had suffered due to shrinking budgets. Between the 60s and 70s, large amounts of the BBC's archival tapes and films were destroyed or wiped to make room for new projects. And while this practice was abandoned by the 80s, it still resulted in a whopping 97 episodes from William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton's time as the Doctor being lost forever. Doctor Who's troubles would only continue to mount through the 80s. Feuding between BBC executives and Colin Baker resulted in the sixth Doctor's abrupt exit and replacement, and the show's broadcast slot was moved multiple times, which all but killed its remaining viewership. While Sylvester McCoy's take on the Doctor won over fans, mounting pressure from BBC leadership to remove the program eventually won out. In 1989, Doctor Who was put on indefinite hiatus, with BBC's head of series Peter Cregeen stating, There are no plans to axe Doctor Who, but there may be a little longer between this series and the next than usual. Cue four years of silence, followed by one final special titled Dimensions in Time, which was... Pretty bad. Despite the BBC's clear desire to move on from the series, Doctor Who was able to survive through its cancellation thanks to the passionate fan base it had cultivated over the years. The Doctor's adventures would continue through magazines and books like The New Adventures of Doctor Who, as well as a number of licensed audio plays. Even the program's lost episodes were given new life through fan reconstructions, paving the way for official restorations and showing the demand that would bring about the program's eventual return. Even a half a century later, Doctor Who's place in pop culture feels stronger than ever, with creators building on its vast history, 
giving representation and validation to an ever-growing audience, and launching bold new experiments in sci-fi storytelling. Does it all stick the landing? Of course not. With a show this big, some ideas are bound to resonate more than others. But in an era full of reboots and remakes, too shy to break away from their source material, Doctor Who continues to blaze a trail into our shared imagination, proudly venturing into the unknown and beyond. One day, I shall come back. Yes, I shall come back. It's the only sad thing. I want to know what happens next. We're all stories in the end. Just make it a good one, eh? It's a fact of life that every story, even the popular ones, must end. Times change, tastes shift, and as a result, the magic of a story fades over the years. But every now and then, something truly magical can happen. The stars align, tastes shift back, and once every generation or so, an old story comes back to life. So where are we going? Further than we've ever gone before. From its first appearance on television in 1963, Doctor Who proved itself a milestone in sci-fi and pop culture at large, from its diversity behind the scenes, to its subversion of the evil invader tropes of other Atomic Age sci-fi, to its ability to evolve with each new decade. While the series would go on to build an impressive 26-year run on the air, slowly pivoting into more silliness and spectacle, decades of mismanagement, mounting critiques from inside and out, and a general aimlessness in the show's later years led to its eventual removal from television in 1989. But even as the series continued to lay dormant, ongoing revival efforts gained steam. And in 2005, all of that unyielding passion finally paid off in the form of a new doctor for a new decade. Aw yeah baby, now we're getting to the good stuff. Because if classic Doctor Who was a product of the terror and wonder of the atomic age, its revival shows what happens when the timeless ideas at its heart confront the fears and fantasies of the modern era. Here we will explore how the show returned, how it evolved into something even greater, and how it secured its legacy as a boundless, timeless sci-fi gem. Fittingly, for a show about time travel, Doctor Who has an amazing history of its own. As I stated previously, the series began as an educational program and steadily evolved into TV's answer to sci-fi blockbusters, with the Doctor subverting the image of the hostile alien with his boundless intelligence and empathy. Was this an intentional message about humanizing the other? It's hard to say, but the results definitely spoke for themselves. Over time, the Doctor evolved from supporting character to leading man, helped along by the stable of rotating companions and the many actors who brought their respective visions of the character to life. Sadly, while the show's premise and scope evolved over time, it was still firmly grounded by the BBC's limited budget, and was eventually eclipsed by a massive Hollywood sci-fi revival. The show's staff continued to push boundaries through political and social commentary, but two decades of shrinking viewership and mismanagement behind the scenes eventually caught up. But even with the show no longer in development, official and fan efforts to revive it persisted. This would eventually lead to a 1996 TV film that would serve as a backdoor pilot, starring Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor. Internationally co-produced between Fox, Universal Pictures, and BBC Worldwide, it's a pretty weird jumble of tones and ideas, probably the result of trying to hook mainstream audiences in the UK and US at the expense of longtime cult fans. And while the film level budget definitely does its effects justice, up to a point anyway, it's also chock full of bizarre choices. Like say, having Sylvester McCoy's seventh doctor mowed down in a hail of Uzi fire. Yeah, not the best send-off for a fan favorite. And Eric Roberts as the master ain't so great either. But in spite of the film's poor reception in the US and the UK, the series' cult audiences continue to rally for a more definitive revival, bolstered by new licensed media and its massive place in pop culture. And in 2005, 16 years after its cancellation, Doctor Who returned to the BBC under the vision of showrunner Russell T. Davies. Having made a name in television with series like 1999's Queer as Folk and 2005's Casanova, Davies was also a lifelong fan of Doctor Who, spending most of the 90s pitching a revival of the series to the broadcaster. They'd phone me up and say, do you want to write a tale of two cities? And I'd say, no, 
I want to write Doctor Who, Davies would reflect. It was the one program that encouraged you to make up stories. When I was eight, walking home from school down Hendrafolan Avenue, I always used to think I could turn around the corner and the TARDIS would be there. The TARDIS could land in the everyday world and no other science fiction program could do that. That's when I fell in love with it. I was transfixed. Despite rejections in 1999 and 2002, Davies' pitch would finally see the light of day in 2003, thanks to an intervention from BBC One controllers Lauren Hegesy and Jane Tranter, as well as head of drama Julie Gardner. After obtaining a 13-episode commitment, the revamped series would begin production in 2004, with Davies serving as head writer and executive producer to maximize his creative control over the series. Working alongside writers Stephen Moffat, Mark Gatiss, Robert Shearman, and Paul Cornell, Davies set about making improvements to Doctor Who's format, doubling episode lengths from 25 minutes to 50 and tightening the pacing of each story. The new series also benefited from healthier effects budgets, leading to more intricate alien designs and a reliance on CGI to better sell the scope of its adventures. And finally, the series' music, including its iconic theme, was given triumphant new life through composer Murray Gold, who used a mix of digital synths and orchestra to lend everything an operatic grandeur. I'm just saying, there's Doctor Who with Murray Gold, and then there's everything else. Just like the original's pilot, the series opens in then-present-day London, following teenage shop assistant Rose Tyler as she crosses paths with the Doctor in the middle of his own mission to thwart an alien invasion. Soon, Rose becomes torn between her mundane life at home with her mother Jackie and boyfriend Mickey, and a life of adventure alongside the mysterious Doctor. While it builds heavily on the history of its predecessors, leaving some stuff out obviously, Doctor Who under Davies also acts as a jumping on point for new viewers, using the show's lengthy absence to re-mystify and reinterpret its mythology for a new decade. This wasn't a world driven by fears of nuclear war or invasion, but one held captive by an onslaught of junk TV, invasive technology, and cheap thrills, desensitized to the wars being waged around them. As such, Davies' new series becomes a clear commentary on Britain's parts in the global war on terror, with new enemies taking the form of out-of-touch politicians, war-profiteering billionaires, and fellow wanderers pushed to the unthinkable in the name of survival. I'm a very political writer. I always have been, states Davies. Every single year in Doctor Who, I either killed or deposed a prime minister. In series one, I blew up Downing Street with a missile. I kind of engage with politics by not writing crime. I don't write crime, but ordinary people engaging with the world, that's what politics is. This show is just putting it more center stage than normal. It's a long-winded way of me saying I'm worried about the world. In a sense, I always have been. At the center of this new vision is a more stripped-back, haunted take on the Doctor, brought to life through veteran actor Christopher Eccleston. While he's still brimming with the charm and brilliance of his past incarnations, Eccleston's Doctor is also noticeably darker and more conflicted, struggling with his role in a war across time that decimated civilizations and left him the lone survivor of his race. The idea of a time war has always been a mainstay in the series' history, from Alan Moore's comics for Doctor Who Monthly to the slew of Eighth Doctor adventure novels written before the show's return. But what distinguishes the revival's take is the cultural context behind it. Through his guilt and rage, Eccleston's Doctor becomes the vehicle for a generation sapped of its hope by an endless war, torn between their violent present and the memory of a more hopeful past there's a real sense that something has been lost or broken inside the Ninth Doctor, with each encounter highlighting the parallels between himself and his enemies. The Daleks have failed! Why don't you finish the job and make the Daleks extinct? Rid the universe of your filth! Why don't you just die?! You would make a good Dalek. It's not all gloom and doom, though. While Eccleston's Doctor converge on broody and cynical, the series counters this cynicism through Rose, an average girl who rejects the hopelessness of the world to become something greater. Companions have always played a major part in Doctor Who, usually serving as wide-eyed sidekicks to the alien man of mystery. And while that's still true here, Rose's arc from aimless teen to heroic co-lead ends up flipping this dynamic, inspiring the Doctor to reclaim his humanity and reject the violence that's haunted him for so long. Prove yourself, Doctor! What are you, coward or killer? 
coward. Any day. This new approach to the show and its characters was an instant hit with audiences, many of whom were captivated by Eccleston's authentic, vulnerable take on their favorite character. But of course, it wouldn't be Doctor Who without disastrous behind-the-scenes shuffling. Despite the success of the show and his character, Eccleston would leave after one season due to disagreements over the onset culture and conditions. And although his absence is felt across the rest of Davies' tenure, the team would use this change to make another parallel to the classic series, bringing back the concept of regeneration and kicking off a larger arc for the hero. So where was I? Oh, that's right. Barcelona. To many, myself included, David Tennant is the definitive Doctor, and it's not hard to see why. If Eccleston's performance was a look into what war can take from us, Tennant's is focused around reclaiming that loss, turning all of his guilt and pain into action. Naturally, this led to a more traditionally heroic, swashbuckling take on the character. And I mean that literally. He has a sword fight in, like, his first episode. With this new Doctor came another major shift in storytelling, as the series began building longer plots that connected across its episodes. Building off of Tennant's natural charisma, this Doctor had much deeper connections with his companions, some leaving the TARDIS better off, others not so much. Ten's relationship with Rose would evolve into something more romantic, highlighting the tension between his desire to live as a human and his legacy as the last of his species. And though the romance was ultimately doomed, with Billy Piper exiting as a series regular after season two, this newly deepened humanity would keep evolving with each new companion. Freema Agiman's Martha Jones, the first post-Rose companion, highlights Ten's failings as a mentor, with his fixation on the past blinding him to Martha's own feelings until she leaves the TARDIS. By contrast, Catherine Tate's Donna Noble is just the kick in the pants this Doctor needs, with her boundless compassion and self-assuredness keeping him connected to the people he's always trying to save. Just try to tell me Volcano Day isn't a character-defining moment. You can't. This fluid, reactive take on the Doctor was the perfect foundation for the show's new stories, honoring the series' vast history while bringing it into the present day. Fan-favorite companions like Sarah Jane Smith and K-9 would return, and many classic enemies would follow, given horrifying new life through the lens of modern society. Mainstays like the Cybermen, the Santarans, and the Daleks would all return as images of humanity corrupted by war and technology, while episodes like New Earth, Gridlock and the Impossible Planet explore futures overrun by unchecked industrialization. Even the Doctor's past ties to the government and the military are reworked under Davies, with the familiar faces of Unit giving way to the authoritarian Torchwood Institute. Dedicating himself to restoring what he's lost, the Doctor isn't just at odds with rogue invaders, he's fighting society itself. And nothing illustrates that better than the series' take on one of his most iconic villains. Just stop! Just think! Use my name. I'll stop. I'm sorry. Tough! Introduced back in the 70s as the dark counterpart to the Doctor, the Master has had an evolution of his own over the decades, growing from Bond villain to walking corpse to whatever's going on with Eric Roberts. However, in Davies' hands, and with a brilliantly campy performance by John Sim, the dynamic between the Doctor and the Master takes center stage. The two survivors become the faces of a post-war schism, a schism that starts to weigh on Ten as his mission to save everyone pushes him towards the authoritarianism that destroyed his people. I've done this sort of thing before. In small ways, say some little people. For a long time now, I thought I was just a survivor, but I'm not. I'm the winner. It's a layered critique of the Doctor as a conscientious objector marked by war. If he can't walk the line between hero and soldier, he's destined to become what he fears most. Celebrated for its intricate storytelling, fantastic effects work, and lovable characters, Davies' tenure on Doctor Who is the definitive distillation of the original, setting the adventurous spirit of the classic years against the wonders and fears of the modern day. The show's broader commentary on the corrupting influence of nationalism and war still feels powerful today, as does its conflicted but hopeful take on its hero. 
By making the Doctor into a surrogate for the audience, Davies is able to channel a nation's post-war guilt into a powerful call to action, encouraging viewers to embrace compassion over violence, even if it leaves them an outsider. Fittingly, Davies' last few episodes are a bittersweet celebration of everything the writer and his Doctor have built together, giving every companion one last goodbye and letting the hero finally triumph over his demons, renouncing his people's war and saving companion Wilf at the cost of his own life. Tennant's own exit from the series is the perfect finale to this era, burning away the show's wartime roots to make way for something new, ambitious, and exciting. All we had to do was strap in and enjoy the ride. By the time Davies and Tennant exited the series in 2010, Doctor Who had undergone a massive resurgence in popularity, with its presence on platforms like Netflix and BBC America finally giving it an international audience. While the show was put on hiatus between its season finale in 2008 and the end of Time specials in 2010, the BBC was quick to capitalize on its success, elevating Davies' collaborator Stephen Moffat to showrunner alongside a new writer's room complete with big names like Richard Curtis and Neil Gaiman. Having started on the series under Davies, Moffat's stories often touch on similar ideas, namely the pull between the mundane and the fantastic, the dehumanization of war, and the hero's arc from alien outsider to caretaker of the universe. What sets it apart, however, is Moffat's approach to tone and storytelling, which lean more into romantic fantasy than hard sci-fi. Long story short, Bit fairy tale. By the time Moffat had taken over as showrunner, the world had undergone another cultural shift of its own. We were removed from the paranoia of the War on Terror, but its after-effects remained everywhere, leading to a general cynicism in culture and media. There was a desire to return to a more innocent view of the world, and through his next Doctor, Moffat set about doing just that. For me, Doctor Who literally is a fairy tale, muses Moffat. It's not that it's like the old fairy tales or that it resembles them, it's the modern equivalent. A man who fights monsters but never becomes one. Every time it cleaves towards that, it's very strong. There's something fundamental in its DNA that makes it a children's program and makes children of everyone who watches it. If you're still a grown-up by the end of that opening music, you've not been paying attention. Picking up right after Tennant's exit, the series follows the freshly regenerated 11th Doctor as he crash-lands the TARDIS throughout the life of Amelia Pond and her long-suffering fiancé Rory, played by Karen Gillan and Arthur Darvill. Having moved on from Britain's post-war anxiety, for the moment at least, Matt Smith's performance is a complete inversion of Eccleston and Tennant's, with his aloof, hyperactive energy crafting a character who revels in his alien status, which fits nicely with how Amy first sees him, a fairy tale character brought to life. With this new Doctor comes a move into more abstract storytelling, focusing on original creatures and paranormal phenomena drawing from gothic fiction and fairy tales. Personally, I think it's a really cool new direction, leading to plenty of incredible episodic stories. Unfortunately though, the earlier half of Moffat's time lacks the cohesion of Davies' meditations on war and redemption. There are still long-running stories present, with plots like the crack in the universe and the Doctor's death set up at the start of each season, but the payoffs don't really come together in a satisfying way, often hand-waved away by last-minute plot twists or paradoxes. Moments like the reveal of River's identity are incredible, but swiftly undercut when you realize that this is all the closure we get for these stories. I guess this means Amy and Rory aren't going to save their baby? Or maybe they already did? It's all a little bit wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Not helped by the late intro of Jenna Coleman's Clara Oswald, a companion with her own heap of complicated lore tied to another pretty forgettable big bad. However, the end to Amy and Rory's story is a beautiful example of how this formula works, kicking off a larger arc that finally gives this take on the Doctor a voice. Through the specials Day of the Doctor and Time of the Doctor, Moffat gives his hero a series of sweeping highs, restoring his homeworld and erasing the devastation of the Time War. Not a perfect metaphor, but it's exactly the kind of cathartic story people were craving after decades of terror and guilt. But of course, it's easy to say we've grown. Proving it is a journey of its own. In sharp contrast to Smith's performance, Peter Capaldi's Twelfth Doctor starts out cold, calculating, and downright terrifying, with episodes like Deep Breath, Mummy on the Orient Express, and Death in Heaven laying his inner darkness bare. 
It's as if all that malice Smith's been tamping down has finally broken through, as Moffat uses the Doctor's lengthy, inconsistent history to ask the question, is he really good? Is he even capable of being good? I'm the Doctor. I've lived for over 2,000 years, and not all of them were good. Capaldi's first season is still a bit of a mixed bag, with Moffat's fairy tale influences chafing against his darker hero. But seasons 9 and 10 build a more defined journey for the character. Grappling with the choices necessary to see himself as good, season 9 explores the Doctor's mercy and cruelty in equal measure through a series of mirroring two part stories, climaxing in the spectacular Heaven Sent and Hell Bent, with 12 nearly tearing the universe apart to save Clara from a terrible fate. While some elements like the hybrid subplot still don't come together in a satisfying way, sorry Steve, you'll get there someday, the fairy tale angle finally gets its payoff, with good triumphing over evil through a simple, powerful phrase. What follows is an incredible reward to three seasons worth of storytelling, as Capaldi's doctor grows into a figure with boundless compassion, taking on a parental relationship with Pearl Mackey's Bill Potts, and working to cultivate a better side out of the returning master, now played by the amazing Michelle Gomez. And instead of diminishing or contradicting, the Doctor's inconsistent past ends up enhancing this direction. It's kind of like a distillation of the character's entire history so far, showing how even when we've lost our way, we still have the hope to grow into something better, and the responsibility to be kind instead of cruel. I'm not doing this because I want to beat someone, or because I hate someone, or because, because I want to blame someone. I do what I do because it's right! And above all, it's kind. Fittingly, Capaldi's final moments as the character are another meditation on how far he's come, teaming him up with one of his earliest incarnations as both work to save the life of a soldier from his impending death. Despite its high concept, Twice Upon a Time is pretty sparse on plot and action, acting as more of a coda to Moffat's thesis on his hero and the series as a whole. Perhaps there's just some bloke wandering around putting everything right when it goes wrong. Well, that would be a nice story, wouldn't it? That would be the best. But the real world is not a fairy tale. Just like the Doctor's regenerations, real life doesn't get any easier. The world is full of darkness, and in many cases, that darkness can be all-consuming. And yet, good prevails. Why? Because we believe in it. We believe in it so much that we make the impossible happen. You were right, you know. The universe generally fails to be a fairy tale. That's where we come in. The special setting in the moments before the Christmas truce of 1914 is another inspired choice, tying the fairy tale of the Doctor to our own desire for a better world. All in all, Moffat's era as showrunner is far from perfect, with the mystery box storytelling of the earlier seasons derailing its overarching plots. But it's still a beautiful look into the heart of its central character and his unending struggle to be better. The series' cyclical nature means that the Doctor is doomed to sacrifice himself again and again, but it's our belief that gives that sacrifice meaning. In spite of our messy history, we can still believe in fantastic, magical ideas. And as long as that belief endures, so will Doctor Who. Oh, Berlin. Just over a decade after its return to television, Doctor Who was once again at a crossroads. The ambition of Moffat's years as showrunner had launched the show into a new level of critical acclaim, pushing the format of sci-fi through its storytelling and redefining the journey of its central character. And while not everyone clicked with Moffat's take on the Doctor, it was still a tough act to follow. After all, how do you build on a decade's worth of long-form storytelling? This next chapter would arrive through incoming showrunner Chris Chibnall, famous for his work on TV series like Born and Bred, Broadchurch, Doctor Who spin-off series Torchwood, and a handful of episodes under Davies and Moffat's tenures. As both a lifelong fan and critic of the series, Chibnall envisioned this next era as a modernized return to form, bringing back the show's educational subtext and returning to the tried-and-true Monster of the Week format, brought to a new level of prestige thanks to a massive increase in budgets and production design. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that this is the best Doctor Who has ever looked. Doesn't mean I'm a fan of the new TARDIS, though. Kinda looks like a big salt lamp to me. 
This era also saw the introduction of Jodie Whittaker, the first woman to step into the role of the Doctor, bolstered by the biggest stable of companions since the classic era. In place of the classic two lead cast, the crew, including Tosin Cole's Ryan, Mandip Gill's Yaz, and Bradley Walsh's Graham, act as one big unit, with their ongoing journeys reshaping their relationships to the Doctor and each other. It's a pretty cool concept, at least in theory. While Yaz and Graham get plenty to work with story to story, Ryan comes off a bit undefined, with his struggles against his disability downplayed in favor of something more cliché. I'm gonna look out for you, son. I'm not a kid. Later seasons would improve on this dynamic, giving Graham and Ryan a satisfying exit and streamlining the cast through John Bishop's Dan. Unfortunately, the same inconsistencies would plague many of Chibnall's stories as showrunner. Some episodes like Resolution, War of the Suntarans, Village of the Angels, and Spyfall give fantastic new takes on established characters, while others like Kerblam, Orphan 55, and Rosa chafe against their real-world allegories, leading to some confusing, if not downright offensive, messaging. We were here. We're part of the story, part of history. Oh, no, no, I don't want to be part of this. We have to. I'm sorry. We have to not help her. But arguably, the most polarizing change of Chibnall's tenure comes through The Timeless Children, an episode that reveals a secret history between the Doctor and the larger creation myth of the Time Lords. Some criticisms of the episode, like how it frames the Doctor as more of a predestined chosen one archetype, are valid. Others, who argue that it takes away the Doctor's central drive as a character, seem to miss the larger philosophy behind the episode and Chibnall's story at large that who you were doesn't determine who you become. If Moffat argues that anyone can be the Doctor, Chibnall firmly adds that the Doctor can be anyone, regardless of who they are, what they look like, or where they came from. When reflecting on his larger plans for the series, the showrunner would state, some of the inspiration for that was personal, because it's an adoption myth, and I was adopted. The thing about where you're from versus who you are, that's really personal to me. I wanted to excavate what the Doctor knew about themselves and ask, what if that's not the whole story? Because there are so many incredible gaps. When you disrupt that sense of knowing where you come from, you can take the Doctor to all sorts of new places. I was just digging deeper into what was already there, making it a personal and emotional story. Unfortunately, if the showrunner had plans to further explore this idea, we never really get to see it. Aside from its divisive reception, Chibnall's time on Doctor Who was plagued with behind-the-scenes issues, which had a clear impact on the pacing and consistency of its storytelling. The new era saw the biggest writer's room in the show's history, a pretty hefty challenge for someone new to the position of showrunner. And while season 11 operated under normal conditions, where ideas and scripts were nurtured in pre-production, the season 12 special and all of season 13 were produced under the height of the COVID-19 pandemic resulting in rushed or even unfinished scripts as the entire crew struggled to adapt to new set protocols. That we made Doctor Who at all during the past two years is a miracle, Chibnall admits. There was a point around April or May 2020 where it looked like we'd have to call it a day after two series. We had to reimagine the production of the show, reimagine the narrative structure of the show. But what I loved about it is it brings creative benefits, but also risk. Creative risk is where Doctor Who should live, I think. And not everybody's gonna agree with that. While it's still fairly polarizing to many, I've actually come around to Chibnall's larger ideas for Doctor Who, and how it untethers the character from any fixed origin without kicking over what came before. If anything, Chibnall and Whitaker's final special is a celebration of the Doctor's entire history, their power as a timeless icon who has touched generations of people, both in and out of fiction. You are not finished. We are not finished. Now celebrating its 60th year, Doctor Who is on the verge of another reinvention, with Russell T. Davies returning as showrunner after 14 years away. And while Davies began this new era by treading a lot of familiar ground, the new series, built as season one of the Hooniverse, seems more ambitious and expansive than ever. Through the reintroduction of lost villains like the Toymaker, the revisiting of past Doctors and Companions through Tales from the TARDIS, the restoration of long-lost episodes from the classic era, even the return of Christopher Eccleston's ninth Doctor through Big Finish's audio adventures, the series' past feels just as bright as its future. 
A new partnership between the BBC and Disney has given Doctor Who a massive boost in production value and an even bigger reach. And with this new reach, Davies plans to bring the show back to its adventurous, hopeful space age roots, all built around Shudi Gatwa's charismatic new take on the hero. Naturally, concerns over the show's increasing brandification have only grown since the partnership was announced. But if Davies' newest specials indicate anything, it's that in spite of all these changes, the series can still tap into what made it great in the first place, using its stories to reflect the ever-growing beauty of the human race. That's the real magic that makes Doctor Who so timeless all these decades later. Its ability to change, to build on what came before, to give wonderful new life to the past, and run headlong towards a brighter, beautiful future. Thanks for checking out today's video and what I'd consider to be my all-in-one retrospective on Doctor Who so far. As a lot of my regular watchers know, I'm a huge fan of all things sci-fi, and with a show as long and as varied as Doctor Who, it's been really fun tracing it back through the years and seeing how each era builds on its decade and our own relationship to science fiction. Just like the character, that vision's always evolving, and even when I come across an unpopular take or idea, I can't help but look at the craft behind it and marvel at what it's trying to do. And I know there's been a lot of talk about Davies' return and the Disney partnership already, but I love that Doctor Who's grown into a global phenomenon. No matter how it's grown or changed, it's always given me a sense of hope for the future. And I hope the bigger it gets, the more people will see that too. If you like this video, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Every little bit helps the channel out a lot. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Carol Ann Brenneman, The Comics Cave, Dom De Felice, and my patrons, who are helping me to grow this channel and continue doing what I love, and hopefully what you love too. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay fantastic.